paint or catching. So next slide is welcome, thank you. Um, and then our next slide, just wanna talk about our why for a minute. Um, the Career Tech Planning District consultants have been working individually um, over the past few years with their tech prep teams to do regional and local professional learning. And this year we wanted to do something as a state um, to maximize on all of our knowledge collectively and then be a little bit more efficient with our time. Um, so we want to make sure that um, we reach out to you um, and make sure our, our students are finding their, their career path. And that picture that Pam had up before, um, we really want to make sure that when we're planning for future careers for students and helping them along that navigate their, their path, that we're thinking of all of our students because they all deserve um, their best future, whatever that might be. And so we're going to just go over a few things that will help um, bring all this together today. Um, Ohio has a requirement to have a policy on career advising that is board approved. And you all um, probably know that. And it has to be re reviewed by the board every two years. Um, and think of the policy on career advising as like the big umbrella that all of your career activities and things um, fall underneath, including graduation plans. So the next slide. Um, and this is just a quote from the department. And I think it, it sums up beautifully what career advising should be in Ohio. Um, the foundational framework of career advising in Ohio is designed to support students in developing a vision and realistic plan for their futures across the K-12 spectrum. Its purpose is to give students opportunities to discover their interests and explore academic and career pathway options through relevant classroom instruction, instruction sorry, uh, career-related learning experiences and consistent counseling and advising. Um, we're not going to watch this video, but I will throw the link into the chat and then you'll have these slides later. Um, but this is a, a video that the department put out a few years ago about career advising, and it really does a great job going over the components of career advising and why it is so important. Um, it's about eight and a half minutes. That's why we're not going to watch it this morning. But um, maybe take a few minutes on a lunch break or something and just and just take a look at it. Um, it's really well done and it really um, covers everything well. Oh, sorry, Pam, you don't have to. <laughs> so one of, the, <laughs> one of the things in the um, in career advising that the department has created for us to use is a career advising toolkit. And that's able to help you um, really like lay out a formal plan for how you want to go about creating your career advising policy and um, relevant activities. Um, there's a really neat uh, tool in there called the equity gap analysis tool. Um, and um, I will throw the link to that in the chat as well. And again, you'll have these slides. We'll post them on our Google site. Um, but on the next slide, you'll see the, the six kind of tenants of the equity gap analysis tool. And so it helps school districts really look at equity across the spectrum for access to programming, um, how culturally responsive practices are being used, if our learning in our classrooms is student-centered, um, if we have a deserve, diverse staff, um, how we engage with family and communities, um, and then school climate. Um, so think of PDIS kind of things. And then the fiscal component is embedded in each one of those six items. So you'll be able to really have a broad picture of what equity looks like in the district um, if you go through this tool. And all of us at the state support teams and tech prep are able to help you with these things. So if anything seems overwhelming today, just remember we're here to help. Um, the next slide. 
just thinking about today, when you go to your sessions, think about um, for career advising, how are you implementing it? Um, and are you planning for pathway access for all students? Um, how do you expose the early grades to careers? Um, do they have, do you have a way for them to explore things systematically? Um, do you have any embedded career paths? Um, student choice, how do you manage that um, with your resources? And then utilizing district departments. Some schools really work at um, embedding things in their district to provide more access. So thinking, think of your maintenance and um, construction departments when they're building little projects for the buildings. Um, think of the warehouse and how the central supplies are managed. Um, think of technology, how the break fix, you know, can you have students helping you with those things? Next slide, thank you. So we're gonna go over graduation plans real quick um, and graduation requirements. Um, this is just a review of graduation requirements. So if I say anything that you haven't um, heard about um, or you're new to and you want more information, please reach out to us um, after and I'll show you how you can find all of us um, when I'm done um, with this opening presentation. But we realize that there are staff changes every year in departments and districts and um, people might have been working in an elementary school and they hadn't been you know, focused primarily on graduation and now they are. So if you need any assistance with these things, just let us know. Um, so as part of career advising, graduation plans are with, embedded in that and they could also support your policy. If you go, thanks. Um, so graduation planning, um, this is from the revised code and I just wanna hit a few things from that. Um, and I'll put the code in the chat if you um, want to run out and take a gander. Um, it's an easy to read um, revised code. Um, spells it out pretty clear. Clear. So it says all districts must have the policy for students at risk of not graduating or qualifying for a high school diploma. And then as part of that policy, kids in nine through 12 should have a graduation plan that addresses how that child's gonna meet their graduation requirements, um, be developed jointly with the school and parents, caregivers, or guardians must be invited to insist, assist in developing that plan. And that should be updated annually. And then um, the graduation plan should be used as criteria for when you're looking at your data to determine who's off track for graduation. And then I just wanted to put this on here too, because some schools that I've been working with recently notify um, students or, and families in their senior year, but they haven't been notifying every year. So every year a child's off track, you, the district is supposed to have a policy or a procedure and how you go about notifying families that their child's at risk of not graduating. So just like um, our, our students have different strengths and weaknesses and interests and needs and all that good stuff, um, think about this in the terms of students with disabilities and their IEPs. Um, we are required to have transition plans in Ohio. Um, and so in those transition plans for students, we need to look at these areas. We always look for strengths, preferences, interests, and, and needs. Um, sometimes they're called pins, sometimes when people wanna call it spins, but anyways, think of it like these bowling balls or the bowling pins, and we're trying to make sure we get all of them. So Pam, if you click again, there we go. We wanna get a knockout, right? We wanna make sure these graduation plans, their transition plans, really take that whole student into account and um, help them plan for their future. Um, and so we have to do that considering all of those strengths, preferences, interests, and needs. We, we really need to consider that whole student when we're helping them develop these plans. All right, so some things to, 
think about today um, when you hear topics about graduation plans. So who owns those graduation plans? Do the students own them or do the adults? Or is it a joint effort? Um, we see a lot of schools spending a lot of time with their adults owning those graduation plans. And absolutely, we need to have some oversight over them, um, but they are that student's graduation plan. So helping them understand and um, track their own um, requirements um, could be a good thing um, to start thinking about. Um, when do we start teaching families and students about graduation and all of those requirements? Um, we know they're complicated and um, I've been talking about these for four years um, and we always get questions about them. So if we, um, who are supposed to be kind of the experts in this, are still asking questions and getting clarification, just imagine how our families are if they only hear it once or twice. So how are we helping them? Um, how do you engage the parents to continue that conversation? And then how often are those plans revisited? They should be revisited annually, um, but we know that with resources and things being limited, sometimes that is difficult. So how often are you doing that? All right, so I'm like I said, I'm gonna hit the graduation requirements um, at a high point here. And if you have questions, you can reach out to us for some clarification, or you can reach out to the Office of Graduate Success and I put the email address for their grad um, inbox right there. All right. So the next slide, um, hopefully um, this, like I said, is a review for you. Um, Ohio's long-term graduation requirements, students need to meet requirements in all three areas and we call them kind of three buckets of information um, or requirements. So the first one is their course requirements. Second is a demonstration of competency. And the third is a demonstration of readiness. And then on the next slide, it talks about those course requirements. And these are the state minimum requirements for the number of credits a student needs to have to graduate in Ohio. Um, please note that financial literacy is now um, required for our students graduating. Um, and um, you may have, your district may have more than the state minimum of credit. So um, you want to check those at your local level to see what else may be required. Then for demonstration of competency, that second bucket, um, this is where students um, use their end of course assessments for Algebra One and English Language Arts. If they reach a score of 684, then they have um, shown competency on the end of course assessment. If they're taking the alternate assessment, then the scores are there on the right of your, your screen. If, however, a student is not a great test taker or they're struggling in algebra or ELA too, um, we are allowed to use these competency alternatives. We, we have to test the student twice and provide remediation in between the first and second attempt. Um, but if a student is unsuccessful a second time, then we can officially jump to these competency alternatives. College Credit Plus and um, ACT or SAT remediation free scores, those are on the outside circles. Those are definitely things to take a look at. Um, but we don't, I don't focus on those as much just because if the students I'm working with are struggling with algebra or ELA two passage. Um, college credit plus and ACT, SAT remediation free scores are gonna be a little more challenging. So then I look at those two in the center, military enlistment and career readiness. If a student is interested in the military, great. Um, that um, requirement is there um, and they can show that they're enlisting um, in the military after passing their ASVAB. Um, However, if military is not their thing or they're not sure they wanna do it, then I look at career readiness alternative. And we're gonna look at that one a little more in depth on the next slide. So to do the competency alternative for career readiness, students need to have two demonstrations 
um, to show competency. And one must be from this foundational bucket. Um, and those things are listed, the things that count as foundational demonstration are listed right below. So a cumulative score of proficient or higher on three or more web exams in a single career pathway, those tests, the web exams are for career technical courses. So if you have students engaged in career tech, um, they're going to be taking some web exams at the higher levels. Middle school, they don't have to do web exams, but the um, higher levels do. Um, students could also earn a 12-point approved industry-recognized credential or a group of credentials totaling 12 points in a career field. Um, it's real important that they're all from one career field, um, and we can help you navigate that if you're looking at um, bundling some credentials together. They can also earn this by earning a state-issued license in a vocation that requires an examination. Think of those state um, licenses. So um, state tested nurses aid is one, a cosmetologist is one. Um, there are different things listed on the credential site on the department's website. Um, and then the last one is a pre-apprenticeship or apprenticeship program um, that's registered with the Ohio State Apprenticeship Council. Um, so those are all the foundational aspects and they need to, students need to have at least one. You can have more than one, um, but they, they have to have one. They can't have just two from supporting demonstration um, to reach the competency alternative. So the supporting demonstration is 250 hours of work-based learning, earning a workforce readiness score on the work key set of tests, which is currently a 14, and then earn the Ohio Means Jobs Readiness Seal. So the next slide, um, and Pam, if you just go ahead and click twice, I think those things will pop up. There you go. We focus a lot on these um, things with the red boxes around them because um, you get two for one. So if you get 12 points of industry recognized credentials, you'll also earn that industry recognized credential seal um, that's at the bottom of the foundational demonstration box. And if students earn the Ohio Means Jobs Readiness Seal, which is a supporting demonstration for competency, then they'll also get that seal. And that's um, the next set of um, requirements to demonstrate readiness. You can go to the next, there we go. So to demonstrate readiness, students must earn two seals. Um, there are 12 seals um, available in the state. Um, to earn the two seals, one of those has to be state defined. Um, the other one can be local. Um, and then there are nine state defined seals and three local seals. You can go to the next. So these are just the graphics for the state seals. Um, you can check on the department's website. Each one of these seals has requirements for how students would earn that. Um, so you can dive into that a little deeper if you if you like. And then the next slide talks about local seals. And the local district has the ability to define what meets the fine arts and performing, fine and performing arts seal for your district, um, community service and student engagement. The one thing I would ask you to think about when you're looking at these seals is just access. Can all of the students access these seals? Um, so when, you know, when the first, when the state first said we we're gonna define these seals locally, everyone, um, you know, went about that and defined things and some wanted to be very rigorous. And while I applaud rigor, um, just we just wanna caution that they're accessible. For example, some districts say you have to have 200 hours of community service, where another district might say 60 hours. Um, and then do you provide transportation or things um, locally around the school where students could walk or something like that if they don't have transportation access. Um, same for fine and performing arts. Think about all those ways students can demonstrate that. Sometimes they say it, it has to be a school-sponsored activity. 
but if a student is in um, um, gymnastics or a dance club or a theater group um, outside in the community, could those also work? Um, and then student engagement, same thing. Think about outside activities as well. If a student is in scouts and they're earning an Eagle Scout, they're very engaged. So could those things count? Or if a student is in 4-H, um, is that something that they can use as well to show their engagement? So pathways through graduation, we really are focusing now on making sure we get students to their next step. So not just graduation, we wanna see and help them find out what they're going to do after they graduate. Um, so when you look at these, this Venn diagram, you see the student interest, um, community or regional need, reliably achievable options. When we first started really implementing these graduation requirements, we did the reliably achievable options pretty well. Pam, you can go ahead and click. And you can do the next one too. So as we get better at this and we've put some things in place, we should start to see these circles start to overlap and that Venn diagram collapse. Um, and hopefully very soon we'll have the next picture where student interest the community needs and the achievable options are all together. Um, we want students to understand that there are jobs in their local community. So by working with our local businesses, we can create some pathways to graduation that students can meet. Hopefully they'll match their interests. Um, and we also have to consider um, helping, helping the students consider that sometimes their interests um, may lie outside of work and that's absolutely okay, but we want them to enjoy their work. So how can we help them meet a community need um, or a regional need with their employment in the future? So these are just things to consider, again, thinking about your graduation pathways. Um, what do they look like? Do you have options for all types of students. So the kids that are going to college and have already expressed that, do you have options for them to learn about what career they want to do in the future? Um, do you have um, options for vocational or technical students um, that are more interested in the technical things with or without career tech? Um, do you have some variety of career fields represented? represented? Um, and then what do you have for students that have already said, listen, I don't want to go to college. I want to do, you know, I want to go right to work. What kinds of things do you have for them? And then looking for when you plan for additional pathways, how do you know what your students are interested in? Have you surveyed them? Have you talked with them? Um, what are you, what are you doing to find that information? Um, how do you maximize their senior year? If a student's on track to graduate, they typically just need English and math their senior year for their, their required credits. So what are you doing with the rest of that time? Instead of letting them come in late or leave early, are you saying, let's find a pre-apprenticeship, let's find some job shadowing, let's find some volunteer work where you can experience different careers or jobs and get a, get a, a better idea of what's out there after graduation. Um, do the interests align with the labor market? Um, that's why I was talking about a second ago. Sometimes the students' interests, you know, there aren't jobs sometimes for some of the things the interest, they're interested in. So what's their plan B? And how can we help them find their interest, maybe in a volunteer aspect or a hobby aspect, um, while doing um, going to work at a job they enjoy? And then how do we partner with businesses in the community to create those opportunities for students? So to I, the next thing in, in career advising and just good practice is making sure you're able to identify those students that are on and off track as a part of that career advising policy where it says we're going to notify families if they're at risk of not graduating. So Pam, you can go to the next slide. 
So really knowing what your criteria are for determining whether a student is on and off track. Um, do you consider any course failures? Um, do you consider any class, um, math, English, language arts? Um, do you take into consideration their Ohio State testing results, um, behaviors or attendance? Um, and then how do you communicate this? Um, how do the students know what's required to move um, from freshman to sophomore level? Um, what about the families? Um, do you have to update anything in policies or on your websites? Um, how do you use um, things like Parent Square or other social media reminders to help families understand? Um, engaging families, just making sure that we're helping families understand um, all of the different choices that are out there for their child. You know, um, sometimes families just talk about their careers in their families with their kids. So um, growing up, kids know like what mom and dad do or what their aunt and uncle do, but they don't realize that there's this whole smorgasbord out there for them. Um, so how do we help families um, engage in that discussion and learn alongside with their child? Um, do we take advantage of all of those things on the, on the screen, you know, different electronic means of communication during transition planning, um, during different meetings like parent-teacher conferences, open house, IEP meetings? Um, and do we meet parents where they are? Do we have things outside of the normal school day to make this discussion more accessible for them? All right, so the big takeaway from all of this um, at the end of the day is we want you to start early. We want you to use your data to inform your decisions. Um, we want you to involve students and parents and families um, and to plan for parallel pathways. You have their, the students' data for middle school, so you know um, where students are when they enter and what they you can predict where they might be struggling. So it's absolutely okay to plan for parallel pathways and the students can graduate with more. We always want them to do well on their end of course assessments, but we know for some kids, test taking isn't their thing um, or they're just struggling with those concepts and that's fine. Um, so how do we help them plan ahead and um, do some things early on in high school to be ready for graduation? Um, and those students that are successful, it's fine for them to have something more. Um, they're just getting more quality education and, and connections um, that they can use in the future. And don't forget that we're here to help. So you can reach out to the state support teams, your tech prep teams, um, the ESCs and the department with questions to ask for assistance. So now we're gonna get to today, what we're gonna do um, today and we'll just do a quick review. Um, so everybody has been using Zoom. All of our sessions today are in Zoom. They'll be recorded. Um, you can ask questions, you can raise your hand, you can put things in the chat, um, whatever you need to get the most out of your day. Um, I always do that. That slide's there to remind me that they're going to be recorded. So we'll record them and then we post them to our Google site um, as soon as we're able to, usually by the end of the week. Um, I do want to go ahead and say, though, that these promising practices, um, they're not exemplars yet. Um, they're real practices by schools in the trenches working to provide their students with the best education possible. Um, these sessions intend to highlight the practices and give you ideas to jumpstart your thinking, planning, and creation of innovative practices in your community. Um, we want you to take away like, oh, that was so cool. How could I tweak that or do that in my own community? And then the next two slides, we'll just um, glaze over these. These are just a note about the industry recognized credential sessions that we did in January and February and that they are um, posted, the recordings are posted on the website. Okay, you can go to the next one. So the website walkthrough, um, Pam, are you okay doing this? I can talk to you, but 
Okay. I forgot about that part. <laughs> so you want Jody to put sign? the link in chat. Okay. Okay. Oh. Here we go. So here's our website um, that you can see there. And on the updates and info tab. Um, um, where is that? The second one. Oh, sorry. No, that's okay. The updates and info tab, if you, Pam scrolls down just a little bit, there's a schedule at a glance there. And that just has all the quick Zoom links for you um, because on the April 16th tab, it gets a little busy with all the information we have there. So those are the sessions you have to choose from today. Um, and then we'll wrap up together at 3.30. Um, it'll be very brief. We just wanna bring everything together from this great day of learning. And then Pam, if you go to the April 16th tab, there we go. And then that tab has um, where you'll find the rest of the information for today. I'm assuming you were already there this morning to find the link um, to this session. So um, we finished our opening session here in just a minute. And then at 10 a.m., We'll um, start with our next group of sessions and you have four things to choose from. Um, so there's a little bit of information about each session and then the Zoom link is there. Um, the presenter's email is there and then the um, host is there. So in case you're having trouble, um, you can click on their name and email them if you have a question. Um, on the more tab, um, you'll see on May 8th, we're going to have a session on industry recognized credentials. And then um, the rest of that site um, resources, um, they're just different links to things that, that we found that might be helpful to you. Um, so a few videos, I, the career advising um, videos there again, um, create, create Lead and Power has some great resources for you to find, look through. Um, that you might be able to utilize in classrooms. And then I think um, there are um, there are a maps to show what region you might be in for tech prep and SST. So if you're not sure who to reach out to, um, all of our information is there under contact information and then those regional maps. Um, so you can find um, the consultants and then Good look happy. group. Yeah. There you go. And those regional maps just help. Because you know in Ohio, we have to have different kinds of maps for each organization. So um, that's the SST map. And then a little bit further down is the tech prep map. So you can look at your county and see where you fit. Okay, so just a reminder on that session coming up, um, we'll have a little bit more information about that. And so right now, um, we're going to go ahead and let you go. And our next session start at 10 a.m. And we'll see you back at 3.30 for a brief wrap-up session. And the link for that is on the schedule to glance as well. So okay. have a great day. If you have some questions, um, I'll hang out for just a few minutes to see um, how I can help you.